Hi everyone, welcome to the Holland Historic Holland Heritage Museum. Um, we're extremely excited and happy to have you here. Before we start the program, I would like to um, take a moment to recognize that we are on native land. Please think and honor of those who have preceded us, including the people of the Wamish, the Stokwamish, Nisqually, and the Mogadishu tribes. Now, this um, part of the program, we always gonna be acknowledging. This is not just a one-time deal. It's something that we're always gonna be doing it every in every opportunity that we have. So thank you for that opportunity. And now I'm gonna bring Crystal to introduce the program. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nancy. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We'll get some energy in the building. <laughs> um, I'm so glad you're all here. Tonight, we welcome you to Seven Stories. We are so grateful again to the Highline Heritage Museum for physically hosting us in this beautiful space and to all of you here that were able to come out and support. Uh, we also extend our gratitude to Scott Schaefer from the B-Town blog for hosting this live streamed event and welcome all who are taking the time to join us virtually welcome seven stories is an evening of storytelling where we invite everyday people to share real life experiences based on a particular theme seven stories for seven minutes not fake stories but real experiences as it always goes often we start these events as a group of awkward strangers <laughs> and by the end of the night feel a sense of connection and community through this shared experience. I'm hoping that's what the result will be by the end of the night for you all. We hope that you'll make each storyteller feel welcomed and at home by being a pleasant and encouraging audience and making sure to silence your cell phones, please, to reduce distractions and interruptions. So if you could do that, that would be fabulous. So now this evening I ask you, what's in a name? Because last week was the first week of spring and that comes with a lot of expectations here in the Northwest, but typically that does not include snow. <laughs> and if we've learned anything in the past two years, we have learned to pivot, be flexible, and welcome the unplanned and unexpected. So tonight, we'll be hearing six stories this evening as an exercise in keeping everyone on their toes, lest we dare get used to falling into the comfort of guaranteed anticipations. So without further delay, let's begin, shall we? Uh, our first storyteller is going to be Josh Gertzman. While Josh's day job is on the executive leadership team at Highline College, in his volunteer life, along with his wife, Heather, they are both dog handlers within our local search and rescue community. Over the past 25 years of volunteering, he and his dogs have a lot of interesting stories to tell. And tonight he will be sharing one of them. So welcome, Josh, come on up. Well, it was a Wednesday evening. We had already had dinner, the dishes were put away, our son was getting read to, and we thought we could just sit down and relax, and our pagers went off. That was a sign that somebody might have been missing or that the local search and rescue team just had an announcement for us. We picked them up and read and said a missing man, missing elderly man in Newcastle, and they needed the dog teams and some ground search and rescue teams to respond. Well, since we had a five or six year old son, he was one of those ages, uh, our, my wife and I would kind of do a um, rock, paper, scissor to decide who got to go out that night with our dogs and who got to stay home with our son. And I won or lost, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> so I packed up the Suburban and got my dog Edgar and my search and rescue gear uh, in, in the car and we headed off to Newcastle. You always get a little bit of heart racing energy when you go off in a search. You wonder what the situation is. You wonder, is this gonna be the time where I am searching streets and alleys while other people are searching the place where the person might be? Maybe they get the chance to find and help the individual. All these things come in through your mind. Is this the night that we make that find and, and help bring somebody back to safety? So we show up at the fire department up in Newcastle, up on the hill and we're told that Michael uh, had been missing since early afternoon. Now Michael liked to walk and he could walk pretty far, but one of the places he liked to walk was Gene Coulon Park in Renton. 
However, he would need a ride to get to Gene Cohen Park. But knowing that that was one of the spots that he may have figured out a way to get to, they asked for teams to be able to go down. So I rose my hand and I said, yeah, sure, we can head down there. I can get uh, in the car and, and drive down. And they said, great, get ready and we'll have other searchers. Now here's the thing, if only I had listened to that one other piece of instruction that said, if you wait two minutes, we'll print up a flyer and you can have Michael's photo on it. But I didn't hear that. <laughs> I got in that car, the adrenaline was going a little bit further and I showed up at Gene Colon Park. Turned on my radio, got my radio pack and my backpack on, put my search vest on Edgar, because that was how he would know that he'd be about to go to work. On the radio, they said, hey, for those of you who are gonna be searching the park, the park staff has said, please let them know when you're done so they can close the gates behind you uh, when you're finished up. So normally I would have a support person with me when we're working with the dog. So somebody can pay attention to other details, uh, things that I might miss because I'm looking at the dog. But in this case, I knew that other searchers were coming. The park isn't that big. I felt good about working solo with, with Edgar. And our dogs are called air scent wilderness dogs. That means that they don't need to be on leash. They don't need to have an article of clothing to uh, search for a specific scent. They're actually searching for any human scent in the area. And if they find somebody while they're off leash, they come back to us, they tell us. Uh, in this case, they tag a toy that's hanging on our belt and we say, show me. And they bring us back to the person that they have found. So again, they want to be able to find any human that might be in the area we're looking. The thing is, when you train dogs to be able to use their nose, they use that nose for other powers as well. On previous searches, I had the experience where Edgar once ran away off from me, and typically if he finds a person, he's very consistent about coming back and tagging that toy. This time, he was gone, and he was gone for a long time. Now, today, our dogs wear GPS collars, and we have a, a unit, and we can actually see exactly where they are. Back in 2005, 2006, we didn't have that technology. And I only could really know where he was if I could hear his bells, if he were to come back to me, or if I might hear somebody out there in the wilderness or wherever we were scream. So one day in Woodenville, we're searching and we're in a green belt and there's large houses, almost a state like uh, plots. Uh, and then I heard somebody scream. The scream I heard was, there's a dog eating my pizza. <laughs> so I had to do the run of shame up into somebody's backyard and up their deck steps and pull my dog out of their house and apologize and let them know we'll be on our way. Another time in Enumclaw, we were searching along Highway 410 between Enumclaw and Greenwater, and Edgar took off across the highway, which I had to follow because that was a safety issue. To my dismay, I watched him jump through the open window of Deputy McMean's a uh, police cruiser, oh. grab a cellophane wrapped sandwich, <laughs> swallow it, and jump out the other window. So Is he a lab? he's a lab, yeah. and, and Edgar was somewhat famous throughout uh, King County, but not always for finding people. So on this night, when he took off from me and he hadn't come back really quick, I started walking or running a little faster. And I, if you know Gene Colon Park, you know that there's an Ivers in Gene Colon Park. <laughs> And at the end of their shift every night, the Ivers crew tended to throw French fries out the back door for the seagulls to be able to enjoy an evening meal. Well, this time Edgar was enjoying the evening meal and the seagulls were flapping around him squawking because they were not happy about being interrupted. So I made my way up another walk of shame up to the dog and said, hey, we got to get to work. And so I pulled them off and I went, walked east away from the lake and I said, go search. And there was this building that looked like a maintenance building. And Edgar took off again, his nose went up. I saw him disappear around the backside of the building, but this time he wasn't eating French fries because he came back to me, he tagged the toy on my belt, and I said, show me, and he brought me back. And on the backside of that building was a gentleman who was picking up garbage. And I had in the back of my head that the maintenance crew was gonna close the park when we were done. So I said to the gentleman, I'm Josh, this is Edgar, we're with King County Search and Rescue, we're out here looking for Michael to which the gentleman said, yes, yes. And I said, and we'll get out of your hair as soon as we're done. Um, and I said, let's get back to work. And Edgar started um, working, you know, continuing to work. And the gentleman started to follow me. And I said, yeah, it's, we're good. We'll, we'll, we'll make this quick. If Michael's not here, and he said, yes, yes. And I said, then we'll just, you can lock up the gates. 
Well, pretty soon we made it back to the cars and Steve Allen, one of the other search and rescue volunteers looked at me and said, hey, you found Michael. To which I looked at the maintenance man and I said, yes, yes. And Steve flipped open the flyer with Michael's photo on it. And I'm like, well, hey, Edgar, you did good. You found Michael. Well, Michael was no worse for the wear at that point. And so we reported to base that we had found him and they okayed me to put him, uh, welcome him in my car and drive him back up to the fire station to be re reunited with his wife. So as we got in my car and he buckled his seatbelt and I looked over at the hubcap, the newspaper and the pot bottle that he was carrying, I said, so what were you doing out there, Michael? And he said, having a good day fishing. And at that point, all I could say was, yes, yes. <laughs> and in the years that we've been spending in search and rescue and had the chance to search for elderly individuals who might have dementia and Alzheimer's, I've always thought of Michael and his day fishing. And when we got back to the search base and Michael got reunited with his wife, and um, we always do a debrief at the end of our search and rescue missions. And so one of the questions was, did anybody le learn anything today? <laughs> and I said, yeah. The next time I'm going to listen for the part B of the instructions <laughs> that says we have a flyer or we have information. And so as I walked away, they said, hey, Josh, you guys did good. Have a good night. And I turned around and I said, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much for that wonderful treat, Josh. Uh, now we're going to welcome Jeannie McCain. Jeannie is retired from the pipe valve and fitting business and is currently the office manager at HHM. She attended the University of Washington, go Huskies, and has a special love for Mustangs, including going to car shows and working on them. So please welcome Jeannie McCain. They do make a shirt that says still plays with cars for, <laughs> for us grown-ups who haven't grown up. When um, I talked to Sybil this afternoon to try to find out exactly what she meant by if I only had listened or if I only listen or what have you. And I think I was thinking it goes a whole bunch of ways. You can say if only I had listened, and maybe things would have turned out differently. Maybe you might not have gotten yourself in trouble someplace in the long line. Or it could be, if I only had listened to person A, for example, I might have done better than if I had listened to person B. They're down there. Then there's also, if I could only listen to somebody or something and go from there. So I was thinking about times that it mattered whether I listened or not or who I listened to. And like she said, I spent 40 years in the steel pipe valves and fitting business. And early on, I was on the sales desk, and this gentleman called. First off, we had a problem because the receptionist learned that this gentleman called me Patty. I answered to Julie, Judy, Jenny, Joni, Janie, <laughs> and Patty. And so he didn't want to talk to a girl because girls don't know nothing about pipe valve and fittings. Well, guess what? I didn't listen to him. If I had, I wouldn't have been at the business for 40 years. And I wouldn't have been a success at what I was doing for 40 years. And... It was, you know, you eventually learned that in that business, it didn't matter that I couldn't go out and physically install a valve or weld the pipe or do anything like that. All that was required was that I knew 
what the material was and I knew what to tell the plumbers and the fitters to go get. I just needed technical knowledge. I didn't need physical knowledge. If I had uh, listened to the little old man who told me and girls don't belong in this business, then it would have been their loss, but yes. And then one of those instances where you listened to the wrong person, didn't learn to listen to positive things and let the negatives overtake it. Tacky as it sounds, my mother didn't like me. Um, she had two strings of adjectives for me, both, both three long. One was short, fat, and ugly. The other one was stupid, lazy, and irresponsible. She used them in a group. She used them individually. Didn't matter. Never publicly, just to me. My mother has been gone since 2000. And I still haven't gotten over listening to her tell me those things. And then there's my Mustangs. <laughs> that makes me smile. Uh, when I was graduating from the University of Washington, so 1965, long time ago in a faraway place, for my graduation present, I was getting a 65 Mustang. And I kept saying to my father, or my father kept saying to me, are you sure you want a four-speed? Yes, Dad, I'm sure I want a four-speed. Everybody around me said, you'll regret it. You live in Seattle, you can come down the hills, you can't, yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't listen to them, and I told my father, yes. I've never regretted it. I still drive one. Um, I don't like automatics. And for anybody here who drives a stick on a regular basis, this is automatic as an automatic to, to most of us. So they're words. And you have to listen and pay attention to the right ones. I have to listen to this one back here because she tells me positive things. Um, and that does more for helping the self-confidence that my mother destroyed than you know, much else that I can do. It's listening to the positive people that are around you and listen to what they're saying and listen to the tone of voice that they use. Listen to the way they use their words. If they say, listen, please, is a whole lot different from somebody saying, listen. <laughs> Same word, yeah. different meaning. So it's important that you figure out where does the emphasis go on this if I only listen? Do you only listen to the good stuff? Do you learn to filter out the bad stuff? Do you have the strength to stand up when somebody uses the bad stuff? I'm learning, I'm only 79, so <laughs> by the time I'm out of here, I should have figured it out. And that one helps a whole lot back there. That's it, that's me. Oh my goodness, Jeannie, thank you so much for that powerful interpretation. I'm sure a lot of us in this room can relate, um, so thank you. And especially the, the part that I like the most is um, your love for Mustangs and being in the um, pipe fitting business. I, um, as a child, um, and by the way, my name is Crystal. I, I didn't introduce myself because I assume people know me. My name is Crystal. I've been in the area for about eight years. I work at Lake Burien and Presbyterian Church, and I'm a part of the Seven Stories Committee. So there you have it. And I like nails and heels and makeup, 
and automotive and electronics and tools and working with my hands and dirt and all of those things together. So thank you for being, I, I got you, we're, we're right here. Yep. <laughs> I love it. Um, so let's welcome our next uh, storyteller, which is Sybil Davis. Sybil graduated from American University in Washington, D.C., and was a long time resident of Alaska before moving to Burien, blessing us with her presence. She is a committed Francophile, and I needed to Google that because that was a concerning <laughs> word to me. And for those of you that like me, maybe not don't know what that is. It's just essentially someone who's fond of France or the French. So she is one of the major visionaries for our seven stories events, which were inspired by her storytelling community in Alaska. And Sybil will be sharing a story entitled, Which Voice to Listen to? So please help me welcome Sybil. Which voice to listen to? I think like most people, you have two voices. One says, Oh, you're kind of old, you know, come on, take it easy, be, be careful, watch out. And then the other voice says, ah, man, what's life for? Live with gusto. And so I had those two voices in my head when I was given the opportunity to go to Istanbul, Turkey and teach English for nine and a half months. And I uh, listened to the gusto voice and uh, went for it. So I had to convince my husband and I had to also do something with our house. So <clears throat> I, can, I convinced my husband, he was a good sport. He's, he's, a, he's a good guy and so I convinced him. Uh, the house, uh, we had to get, we had to rent it or do something with it. And Juneau, Alaska is a big hub for the Coast Guard. So we put the word out with the Coast Guard and sure enough, right away we got a, a couple who would rent the house. So that's great. Only later did we find out the woman was a, a kinetic something, psychic, um, and and so if uh, if if she went by a toaster, it would break. If she, if she couldn't use a <laughs> vacuum cleaner, because it would kind of blow up, and so she was really a, a very interesting and religious person. So we did not know that, uh, the kinetic stuff. Uh, so we felt secure, we left. About 25 hours later, we are in Istanbul. Oh, we had to put all our stuff in storage. That was another ordeal. But 25 hours later, we're in Istanbul, Turkey, and um, they say Turkiye. They don't like Turkey, because that's a bird. Mm -hmm. And so they get insulted. Um, in Juneau, when we left in August, it was about maybe pushing 60 degrees. When we landed in Istanbul, it was maybe 97. It was so hot and there was no air conditioning. So we were just literally dripping sweat. Having lived in Alaska for years and years, we're just not acclimated. But the people in uh, Turkey are so, they're so friendly and they're so generous and hospitality is one of the mainstays of their culture. And um, all my students that I taught business English to at English First were just splendid. All the women are really, really beautiful. And the men are very, they're very warm and friendly with each other. We'd be, I'd be on the on the metro subway, and their men would be linking arms, putting their head on each other's shoulder. They're very affectionate. It was really really nice. So uh, when I was not working, Ken and I would go all around uh, Istanbul. We saw everything. It was just a, a magnificent time there. Um, the um, it's, there's too many beautiful things to, to recount, but um, two things that I loved more than anything was, uh, I have to back away from the microphone, Simitja! It was a simit seller, and the simit is a big, uh, it's a big pretzel, but it's soft, and it's covered with sesame seeds, and it's warm. Mm -hmm. And the guys would go around with a big, Thing, container on their head and that all these warm simi would be on top and they'd be yelling simi cha simi cha so every morning I would get a simi and that was a highlight the other thing that was interesting was during Ramadan uh, 
I'm not sure what this caller is called, but he would come through all the streets at four o'clock in the morning, ringing bells, making a lot of sounds, because that was the time that you could eat before sun up and still um, adhere to the fast. And he would be selling all kinds of stuff. And then in the middle of the winter was Salep, same thing. Another seller would be going along the streets yelling Salep, Shalep. And it was a really interesting drink, which I, I can't describe. Yeah. It wasn't alcoholic at all, but it was, it was sweet and good. Um, the other lasting thing, aside from uh, wonderful visits uh, to the Princess Islands with my students and everything, was Gurjan Bey. He was my student at Danone Yogurt. So he was an executive for the yogurt company, and I would be taken to his office uh, by a taxi through Istanbul, which in itself is a huge experience right there, because they drive really fast and the traffic is crazy. <laughs> I would get to Gurjan Bey's office and I was supposed to be teaching him business English, but he would really commandeer the whole uh, lesson. And sometimes he would stand up and he'd write on his whiteboard for emphasis, which was fine because we were conversing. And I figured he's learning through the conversation. So he says to me, one of my last visits, um, Sibel, uh, my wife and I had a romantic weekend. And I said, oh, Gorjan, that's very nice. And so then he explains to me that they had gone off for a weekend um, and they had a wonderful romantic time. And then he said he was hoping that maybe they could have another child, but it was difficult. And I said, well, Gorjan, do you, you know there is a time for a woman when she is more fertile? And uh, he had a blank expression and I said, and, well, you know about menstruation and uh, he did know that. And uh, I explained to him that, you know, a woman menstruates about seven or eight days and then about 14 days uh, later from the start, she's especially fertile. And uh, I think he, he said his, his wife me seems to menstruate a whole lot. And so <laughs> I... <laughs> I, I said, well, um, th this is the time when it, she is most fertile. And so uh, he, he was sort of incredulous, but he seemed to be quite grateful for this information. And uh, I left, and I left Turkey, and I don't know what happened to Gurjan Bey, and if, if they had another child. I hope so, and I think so. Um, I think... Uh, the last thing I want to uh, mention about Turkey was that I was walking home uh, from teaching and I'm going down our small street in Beyoğlu and uh, there are two uh, Turkish men ahead of me in long robes and uh, they hear me and they turn around right before they go up a tall um, stairwell uh, in a building. They turn around and they motion me to come on. and. Uh, my two voices said, we're together. And they said, Sybil, do not follow those two men. That's stairwell. <laughs> but I still to this day think, gosh, what, what was it? What would have been up there what, if I had not? <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> if only you hadn't listened to your inner voice. Who knows? Thanks, Sybil. Well, our next presenter and storyteller is Ron Hammond. Ron Hammond is a photographer, retired engineer, and most importantly, a daddy, living back in Highline area after a long time of not living in the Highline area. The story he'll be sharing tonight is entitled Fear No Art. So please join me in welcoming Ron Hammond. Um, I have a, a button on my sweater for, for those in the uh, back row. It shows a kind of goofy graffiti looking profile with a speech bubble that says, fear no art. Now I bought this at the uh, Seattle Art Museum's uh, gift shop a, a very long time. Actually, this is a replacement, but I bought one of these at the Seattle Art Museum's gift shop uh, a long time ago. And I've had it on a, on a sequence of, of sweaters ever since. 
And I've gotten a fair number of responses from it. A lot of people kind of give me the what look when they, when they see it. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the fare taker at one of the ferry terminals looked at me very seriously and said, okay, I'm not afraid anymore, which I thought was good. But much, uh, much later, the uh, young woman behind the counter at the tea shop in the Pike Place Market looked at that button and said, oh, that's a Mirapolsky. And I said, it certainly is. Now, I had no idea who Mirapolsky was, but I wasn't going to let her know that. <laughs> so when I got home, I looked him up. Turns out he's a pop artist of fame in that very narrow uh, uh, slice of the art world who has a studio in um, Venice, California. Of course he does. Where else would a pop artist be? Okay, time passes further. <clears throat> the fall before the pandemic hit, I went to the Highline School District's um, art uh, school art show opening at the community center here in Burien. Now, I love going to these school art events because the kids that are doing art at that time in their junior high, middle school, are having such a good time. And they're getting at these shows, they're getting some recognition and some, uh, some uh, reinforcement for the skills and the uh, the interests that they have that aren't really mainstream in the junior high age uh, group. Well, the little girl who won had the best of show in the uh, in this in this uh, year's show had a piece a wall piece, good sized, um, and the figures in it sort of had the same feeling as the Mirapolsky uh, cartoony graffiti-looking graffiti figures. So after the award ceremony was over, <clears throat> I went over to where she was uh, standing with her parents, and she was, looked like she was kind of shy and kind of just hanging, hanging in there. And I asked her if she would go with me, and we would go over to her artwork that's on the wall, and she could tell me about it. How did, you know, why did she do a, a work like this? What, what was her process like? And she got an okay nod from her daddy, and we, so we went across to, the, uh, to where it was. And on the way over, she said, I'm not very good at talking about what I do. I just like doing it. And I assured her that I, think that I thought she would probably do just fine. When we got there, she was, again, kind of shy. You know, I'm, a, I'm a, an unknown grown-up. What am I doing here? So she was looking at the, at, her, at the piece that she had on the wall. And after she looked at it a little bit, she started telling me about it. She was telling me about how each one of the figures in this, in this rather complex drawing fit together and what they meant to her and how, 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 she found that, how she got them to be organized. It was marvelous she would do it. She did this very articulate description of how that piece came to be. And I was listening to her. With, I was fascinated at how both how intentional and how articulate she was about saying, uh, talking about her art after she assured me that she wasn't good at it at all. So uh, I thanked her and congratulated her again on uh, uh, winning the uh, top of the best of show. And as we were walking back to her parents, she said in the tiniest voice maybe I've ever heard, she said, I really like your button. <laughs> Well, what's a soft-hearted guy <laughs> like me going to do? I took it off and handed it to her, and she pinned it on her blouse. And as we walked on, I'm, I'm kind of keeping an eye on her out of the corner of my eye. And there's this kind of half smile on her face. And she's standing up a little straighter. And there's just this much of a, of a swagger in her, in her step. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Ron. That's wonderful. I, in seventh, I was showing someone an art piece that I did today because I like to paint. 
and someone said, have you ever taken any classes? Did you, did you study art? Did you study painting? And I said, I took painting in seventh grade, so it does pay off at some point. <laughs> Thank you so much. Our next storyteller is Nancy Salguero McKay. And she is the executive director for the Highline Heritage Museum. For the last 18 years, she has been preserving the stories of the Highline region. So I can't think of a better advocate for events such as tonight. She is a recipient of many awards for excellence in her field, including the Exhibit Excellence Award from the Washington Museum Association, as well as the Exhibit Award from the Association of King County Historical Organizations. So we are very honored to have her share this evening. So please join me in welcoming Nancy. Thank you, Crystal. Well, it, uh, it feels funny. It feels funny to present a program and then completely different to be vulnerable and talk to you about my personal stories. I'm always advocating for everyone's stories, but to me sharing my story is like, eh, it feels funny. Um, I'm sharing in the past that I'm 80% uh, deaf. I use my hearing aids. And so that question of if I only listen, it applies to me a little different. Um, I wish that if I can only listen to music, to my parents' voice, to them feel um, isolated, to feel, you know, what's around me, it would be really like at school or, or even in my family, I hate that I will only see everyone talking, but I will not be able to understand what they were saying. It would be really hard for me to, like I see people dancing and it was no way for me to understand what dancing was without me touching the, the speaker so I can actually feel the vibrations. Uh, it would not be, um, you know, I can provide many examples. So when I, when I read this, if I only listen, like Ginny was saying, there's so many interpretations. It's open to so many different ways of how do you do address that. In my case, it's like I wish that I could actually listen every single day. But my story is more about uh, isolation and acceptance and being able part, being part of something. As growing up in a way that I've never felt like I fit in. Um, one of the incidents that happened when I started working in the museum field. I yes, I have 18 years here, but I've been working in the museum field for 20 years in other institutions. And then the um, one of the issues was like, well, is you know, there's not that many people of color in the museum field. And so there would be a lot of advice, like, do you really should go that way? Like, yeah, I love history, I love museums, I love sharing people's stories. Um, throughout the years, I have a lot of experiences of people don't understand it, I'm Mexican. And so like, you are not from the area, you're not here, why are you doing, why are you, why are you here? And it is always, you know, we have wonderful times, we have not so good times throughout the years. And so people around me would say, why are you here? Why are you in the museum field when you are, you know, vulnerable and not just um, feeling welcome, but also being attacked by not fitting in a place that I shouldn't be here. And so one of the um, issues that I had first was my name, Nancy McKay. Legally, that is my name, Nancy McKay. It's not a Mexican name, right? And so people will make an appointment with me through emails and, hey, Nancy McKay. And I noticed that I will open the door. It was one time when I opened the door. And there was this guy that said, oh, you know, I'm here to see Nancy McKay. And I said, yeah, this is me. And he will look at me funny and come down to me and I say, I don't think you understood me. And he will speak so slowly. Um, and I say, I'm here to see Nancy McKay. And my answer was say, it's you who don't understand. This is me. Yes. And <laughs> with that, um, there have been different cases where, once again, people don't like Mexicans. People don't like uh, people of color, um, especially telling pioneer stories or preserving their own collections or doing different things. So there's a lot of kind of a issue that happens when people don't like the idea of a Mexican taking care of, you know, your grandmother's items. Mm -hmm. And so throughout the years, I have many people telling me, well, just get out of that place, just move on, just go to a different field, you know, just find a place that celebrates diversity and, and inclusion and all these things. And 
And I say, no, I, I like this. I like I like the challenge of, of, of being able to understand the other side. Will be, for me, it would be really easy just to say, you know what, I'm not comfortable, I'm not welcome, I don't belong here. Yes, that's the easy way, I just go away. I really wanted to understand the other side. What is happening on the other side? What is the discussion that happens with that? And because of that, I had the opportunity to really place myself in multiple shoes and not just on mine, but all the shoes. And then like in this position, that allows me to, to meet people and to really be more compassion, to have more compassion, to have more empathy, to be able to listen, uh, not to what my convictions or moral values are telling me, but like on the other side, challenge myself to hear more than just my eyes and my brain can actually process. So to me, if I only listen, to those people that say, you don't belong here, I don't think I will be here with you. And I do love the idea of being able to challenge the idea and and maybe not listening to them, but listening to my God. And I'm just so, so grateful that through all the years, I've just been meeting people in one of them, like Jeannie. It's just amazing to be able to, to cultivate a relationship, to nurture that sense of belonging, maybe no ethnically, maybe no in age, maybe no in, in whatever all the angers, but as a human beings. And so I'm just so blessed and happy and joyful that, for the opportunity to actually embrace that. And so to the people that say that I don't belong here, I might, they might be right, I might not belong here, but in a human, in a human plane, we are belonging with each other. We are humans and in that angle, I'm glad that I'm not listening to them. So thank you. You got some snaps from me, Nancy. Thank you for your commitment to living in that tension. We're better because of it. Well, we have one more storyteller of the evenly evening, Emily Pitts. Emily Pitts is a middle school teacher, storyteller, and the co-producer and host at, of Locally Fameless storytelling, I love that, to add Fremont Abbey. And this evening, Emily will be sharing a story entitled, The Bike Ride. So please welcome Emily Pitts. So I have this rule that I need to use everything in my house. It can't be broken or it can't be just shoved in a corner. I need to be able to use everything. And one of the things that had been broken down for quite some time was my bicycle. And so when I heard that one of my teacher friend's husband had started a mobile bike repair shop, I decided that I was gonna get my bike fixed. And so he came to my house, he fixed my bicycle, and this is a bicycle I've had since I was 17. And so that's about like a decade and a half if you hopefully can't tell. Uh, and so I was so ecstatic to get the bicycle fixed that I took it around the block for about 20 minutes and when I came home, I thought, you know what I should do? I should sign up for a bicycle ride, which will make me train for a bicycle ride, so I'll get more exercise, so I'll be thin, which is like every woman's goal. And I did, I got on the internet, I typed, what are the bicycle rides in the Pacific Northwest? And one came up in Oregon, where my sister lives, it was the Covered Bridge Summer Bicycle Tour. I thought, this, this is what I'm gonna do. And it was only $45, and so I signed up, except the bike ride was 100 miles long, and it was in two months. And when I told my mom and my sister, I'm gonna go to see Ellen, and I'm gonna do this 100 mile bike ride, they were like, that's a bad idea. <laughs> that's a really bad idea. And I said, no, it'll be fine. I mean, I'm going on vacation to Europe for like a week, but I'll, I'll rent a bike while I'm there and just bike around the city. And that way I'll get enough exercise so that I'll be able to do a hundred mile bike ride when I get home. And they were like, that's a bad idea. <laughs> that's a really bad idea. But I do not listen to anyone. And so I, I do, I get ready and I train, except my bike was a mountain bike hybrid cruiser. It's about 40 pounds. <laughs> And so I am just riding around the Normandy Park, Burien neighborhoods, which are full of hills. And so I'm getting a really good workout, but I'm not doing more than like 20 miles ever. And then it comes time. It's August. I've driven down to my sister's house in Oregon 
And I show up and she's like, are you really going to do this? And I was like, yeah, I spent $45. So I'm definitely <laughs> I'm not backing out now. And so I load, I load my bike into the car and I go to the race course and I unload it. And I have run, I have ridden 100 miles before. I did the Seattle to Portland twice when I was 18, but that was a really long time ago. But in my mind, I'm like still a college athlete. So I'm like, I can still do this. But I realized that everybody is like wearing top of the line spandex gear. <laughs> and everybody has really thin bicycles. And they have the shoes that like clip in, like they're super serious. And I'm like, oh, I maybe shouldn't have done this. But I take off and I'm going about 10 miles per hour, which is about 10 miles an hour less than you should be doing if you want to finish the ride. So I just keep going and going and going and everyone just zooms past me. They just they just zoom past. And I'm like, it's okay, I'm gonna catch them at the rest stop. And while they're resting and drinking coffee and like having fun, I will just like shove almonds in my mouth and then keep going, which is what I did for 70 miles. And I didn't hate it, but I was actively telling myself that I wasn't hating it every eight minutes. <laughs> I was like, it's okay, it's okay. And I did see covered bridges, but covered bridges look like a barn with a road going through it over water. It's a little anticlimactic, but I saw five of them. And every time I would get off my bike and I'd take a picture and I was like, I made it to another covered bridge. <laughs> How many more do I have? And I made it to mile 70 and that's when my snacks ran out. Oh no. <laughs> and you need a lot of energy to bike 100 miles and my snacks are out. And the other thing that I neglected to really research when I decided to do this was the elevation of Oregon. I assumed that because it was south, it would be flat. <laughs> south of Seattle, that means it's flat. No, this had 3,800 feet of elevation. So I was going up and down and up and down and up and down. And I get to one point, I'm at mile 85. I'm like, Emily, is this the worst thing you've ever done? <laughs> no, keep on biking. Is this the worst thing you have ever done? No, keep on biking. What is the worst thing you've ever done? <laughs> And my mind just goes blank. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I don't, I, but I feel it. I feel it in my soul that I know what the worst thing I've ever done is, but I can't quite face it. And as I'm biking, I realize this panicky feeling that I'm not going to make it to the end is the same panicky feeling I had teaching fifth grade, my first year of teaching, where I had 30 children who would look at me every day and expect me to teach them things. And then I would look at them and be like, I really hope I know how to teach you things today. <laughs> and in that year, I work in the Highland School District. And if you don't know, the Highland School District is very diverse. It has many different children from all over the world. And there are a lot of struggles in Highline. And it was working in one of the toughest Highline schools. And it was difficult. And every day I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna make it to the end of the year, but I have no choice. I just have to make it. And it was like bit by bit by bit because I'm a third generation teacher. And when I had gotten into teaching, my mom was like, are you sure this is a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> Your grandmother was a teacher and I used to take care of her when she had migraines. Are you sure you wanna do this? I was like, yeah. It's going to be great. And she's like, OK, OK. And so as I'm on this bike ride, I'm like, why do I never listen? I don't listen to my mom. I don't listen to my sister. And now I'm caught in this awful situation where I have to keep going for another 10 miles before I can get off this bike. And as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about how if I did listen, because really my mother and my sister only want to keep me from experiencing pain. They just want to keep me from having the pain and the struggle of going through. But it's the pain and the struggle of going through that cause you to grow as a human, that cause you to understand what it's like and empathize with others. And it also gives you really good stories sometimes. <laughs> and so I just really couldn't give up. But I got to the end of that bike ride and I thought to myself, I am never doing this again. 
And when I got home that night, because then I had to like drive back to my sister's house, she was like, well, how did it go? And I was like, she's like, you don't look so great. And I was like, no, I ran out of snacks. She's like, oh, okay. I spent the next three days on the couch <laughs> proving that when you do a bike ride, you really, really should prepare. But since I didn't listen the first time, I will probably do something similar as soon as I find something exciting to do again. Thank you. Wow, that's a big difference in the mic. <laughs> Well, Emily, here's to not listening. Congratulations on finishing. <laughs> Thank you so much for all of these amazing stories. They're wonderful. Thank you so much, Emily. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. It makes a difference that we get to share in person our stories and see your facial expressions and hear the laughter and the oohs and the ahs. Um, thank you for taking the time to lean in and hear these stories. And a special thank you to our courageous storytellers for giving us a little piece of your lives. That's a special privilege for us. Without you, this night can't happen. And we'd also like to thank our partners, the Highline Heritage Museum, B-Town Blog, Burian Arts Association, Burian Culture Hub, for their support in making this event possible. And lastly, a special thanks to the community members that make up the seven stories. Uh, committee for your passion in making space for a community uh, to come together. We are always looking for new storytellers. So if you're in the audience and you're like, I totally could do that. Or if you're like, I don't know if I could do that, but I'm willing to try. We would love to have you tell a story. So there is information in the lobby um, about the next few story uh, telling events, what the themes are, um, what the dates are. And you can also go online at bearingculturehub.org slash seven stories and also at the Highland Heritage Museum site um, on how you can find out more information. So if you're online and you're listening and you'd like to tell a story, go to our site and sign up please uh, so again thank you so much for joining us and until next time take care everyone <laughs>